if you look at humans, that means that if you're in your reproductive age and you're experiencing certain things in life, either good or bad, that are changing you epigenetically, you're training your genome, if we're anything like mice, there's a good chance that we'll pass on newly acquired genetic traits from our adult life to our children. That's transgenerational inheritance. That means that unlike what Darwin said, which it takes tens, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years for random mutations to make their way through by random you know, process and by, by um, uh, natural, uh, natural selection. selection, that the very next generation has been affected genetically by the lifestyle of the parent. And that includes That's stress, revolution. right? That includes yeah. stress. That includes good and bad. It yeah. includes stress, bad diet, good diet, or well, everything. But yeah. I'm right now talking about the psychological interpretation of what's threatening. You know, people, some people are constantly looking at the world and what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, it brings about stress, which of course results in inflammation, all of that. But long term stress and even bursts of stress alter gene activity. And if the mouse studies are true of being scared, which is a form of stress, then the stress is passed on intergenerationally. And we mentioned in the book, at least briefly, uh, what happened to the children of Holocaust survivors yeah. and also what happened to the children of 9-11 survivors right and, here and in the, New York City. In the Dutch famine. So basically, we don't have the genetic evidence in humans yet to say what we've seen in mice happens in humans, but there are stories, right? So if you look at when the Germans at the end of World War II blocked all the food from going into Holland, and there was this huge famine, Dutch famine. It was called the Dutch hunger winter. And what you could see was that certain children who were born of mothers who went through a certain trimester at the peak of the famine, when they were born, were highly prone, all prone to obesity and thus diabetes. And the hypothesis is, and I think we'll have data soon that backs this up, is that the mothers had to learn how to live through a famine while pregnant, right? They're eating tulip bulbs to stay alive. So you can imagine epigenetics modifying the genes to get the most bang out of your buck for the food you did get. You get you're getting more fat, more calorie buildup from a tiny bit of food. So let's say those epigenetic marks occurred and modified those genes. Now the children are born with those same epigenetic modifications, they're eating a Western diet, they're eating fast food, they're eating all the food they want, they're getting more bang for their buck. Next thing you know, they're eating regular meals and getting obese, and they're not prone to diabetes. So that was just one example of where it looks like this is happening in humans as well, that, you know, especially at, at reproductive age. So this is epigenetic modification of gene activity, including actually susceptibility to mutations which may cause cancer or other diseases, chronic illnesses oh, of yeah. all kinds. It's been shown for, I mean, pesticides. Pesticides wreak havoc on your genes. Um, environmental toxins, you know, plastic bottles, or BPA, these things all cause epigenetic modifications that increase risk for cancer. And even, and again, this can be possibly passed on to children.